I'd like to welcome you to the best of CMTS. I'm Christine Longroy with SME. Thank you for joining us. It's been a great day so far. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce the next speakers. And let me just get to the right session. My apologies. It's actually going to be a really good one. Reverse engineering, how to maintain, increase the life expectancy of legacy systems. We all have legacy systems, right? So today we're going to have Gabe DiBello, the president of ENA Electronics, and Mark Hickling, the lab manager, who have a great presentation for you today. So thank you, and welcome, gentlemen. Please. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. Thank you to the CMTS show. Um, we're very pleased to be here. Probably in the next 20 minutes, a half hour, it's gonna be tough to kind of get all the information across to everybody. Uh, reverse engineering is something we've been doing at ENA Electronics. We're based out of uh, Hamilton, Ontario for, uh, for quite a number of years, over 20 actually. We're celebrating our 20th year this year. Um, and our company at ENA Electronics is not only a reverse engineering company, we're a reverse engineering company that's, that's split up into four divisions, five divisions at our company. The first division, obviously, is our reverse engineering division. That's where we basically, I'm, I'm going to read an excerpt out of uh, a book that we've published and, and have uh, gotten published in. I just like to read it because it, it basically explains everything in a nutshell. And it just, one of the inserts are, um, recently, while explaining to a friend what I do daily at work and how present day reverse engineering looks like, I put it as simple as I could that I support the unsupported. In this fast paced, ever growing electronics market, the industry, there are millions of obsolete equipment made by companies that are no longer around, or you can picture the dilemma of customers when they face their expensive equipment have no support and they are unable to find spare parts to service or repair them. The standard response given to, response given to technology has advanced and the equipment is old and outdated. There, this is where reverse engineering casts its lifeline. So basically, that in a nutshell is what reverse engineering is. We basically support the unsupported. Usually, uh, you know, there's a lot of equipment out there in the field, and we're from Hamilton, we're from Hamilton, Ontario, and there's a lot of steel mills out that way that, that definitely run some old um, legacy systems. Um, but those old legacy systems work amazing. Um, they were built to last. But after 10, 15 years, the OEMs, a lot of the OEMs, a lot of the, the uh, the support companies that are out there do not support that kind of equipment anymore. And that's where people in maintenance and management kind of look around and go, okay, we're either gonna have to reinvest millions of dollars and get some new machinery in here, some new te technology in here to look at, you know, look at that sort of equipment and, and see how it's going to last into the future. Or you can take and spend some money, spend some capital investment in the machine that you already have, in the machine that's been treating you well for, for 20 years or, or so. And the only reason that you want to get a new machine is not because it's not doing the job, it's not doing what it needs to do, it's because you just can't get support for it anymore. So if you're looking at output modules, drive modules, whatever it is, they're just not available on the market anymore. And that's where ENA comes into the picture and, and Mark Hickling is going to describe to you exactly what the process is, what some of the equipment that we look at that we can reverse engineer, um, give you an idea of, of the costs and, and savings that are involved and things like that. But that basically is what reverse engineering is. We, we support the unsupported. Um, and like I said, Mark will get more into depth on that. The second division is we, we have a full reverse engineering lab with a repair component to it. So if you have um, drive systems, if you have um, um, anything basically, I like to say electronic, PLC systems, drive systems, HMIs, anything in your plant that needs repair that's electronic, that's where ENA's repair department comes in and, and, uh, and we can repair things like that for you. We have a full-blown um, uh, motor shop, just servo motors, we don't do induction motors, we just do the servo motors, which are the smart motors basically with your encoders on the back. 
and then we have a full-blown uh, renewable energy repair sector that we do all the um, all the turbines in Ontario mostly some in the states we do uh, a lot of the drive work the inverter work the sensor work um, so that's basically in a nutshell what what ENA is comprised of Mark can you give me a uh, uh, this here, oh, no, actually go back to the other one. This book here is, is, is the book that I'm reading out of, if you see in the bottom right hand corner. Um, if you're really interested in, in, in knowing what reverse engineering is and what it entails and, and really down to the nitty gritty, I would suggest that you go on Amazon um, and, and purchase this book. It's not sold by ENA, we have nothing to do with it. We have a few chapters in the book. Uh, we were published in the book, but we, we have no affiliate with, with the book sales or anything. But it is an excellent book to get into to just describe what you're looking at at, ENA, at, uh, at reverse engineering, what it will do for you. Is it worth doing that or is it worth making a, a whole total investment uh, in, in a new machine? We go to the next slide there, Mark. Some of the common uses, and we threw a, a couple up there on the screen for you. Um, for reverse engineering, obviously legacy parts replacement. You've got an old, you know, an old machine that, that you can't get support for anymore and you can't buy parts for. Definitely that's something that you would look at reverse engineering for. PCB service or repair. Uh, you might have a board or a, um, uh, an application that you need to get a service uh, repair done on it or a service report done on it to see what the components are, um, to see if, if, if schematics are available. Um, that's also available or repair, strictly repair. Failure analysis, a lot of companies look for um, failure analysis. You're having the same failure continuously over and over and you're wondering if there's something, is it a heat issue, is it a, uh, a speed issue, whatever it is, you can uh, do reverse engineering to get a failure analysis on that. PCB improvement. Um, this is you're looking at, uh, you know, you've got a PCB and, and you want to improve it. Again, with speed or with accuracy, this is something that, that uh, reverse engineering gets into. And diagnostic and problem solving. So a lot of the times, that basically involves the same as the first three almost. You're, you're looking at management, it's looking at it and wondering what the problems are and what is going on. That's what reverse engineering does. But you'll understand more of that just when Mark gets into the process um, because um, it really shows you how it's done and um, Mark's got about 15 minutes to kind of get through that, uh, something that he's worked on a lifetime. So I'm gonna give it over to Mark. Uh, Mark is our engineering manager, our labs manager. Um, and if we have any questions at the end, we can take some questions off to the side and, and be more specific for you. Mark? Perfect, thank you. Well, uh, thanks, Gabe. Uh, so yeah, my name's Mark. I'm the lab manager at ENA Electronics. Uh, my background's engineering. I got a degree in electronics. As you can tell, I'm not from here. Um, I graduated in the UK. I uh, graduated in 2011. And uh, I've, been doing, I've been working for ENA for five or six years now, um, primarily in the engineering uh, side of things. Um, and I also manage the repair lab. So I'm kind of a hybrid between the two. And uh, I have the great opportunity of uh, presenting to you guys today. So first of all, thank you for joining us. Um, I understand that it's a bit of a crazy time, so it's nice to see some faces. Uh, hopefully it wasn't a, we were glad that it wasn't an empty room. So uh, <laughs> that's good. But let's go through the process. So, uh, ENA Electronics, um, somebody comes to us and they says, hey, I've got a circuit board and my machine is a $100,000 machine. It's sitting there and you know what? This, I don't know, this button doesn't work. So I've got one here. This is from a steel mill. Uh, we've got a, a steel keypad uh, from a CNC machine and literally the button doesn't work on it. I've never seen this in my life. I will never see it again. But that machine is $100,000 to the customer. Do they throw it away? Do they get it reverse engineered? No, they come to us and then we make a replacement keypad with a replacement button and now we have the design files and now we can support you for as long as you need for that machine to keep going. Or we take another one and this is a slightly more complicated situ situation. We have something like this. This is a, a, actually a gun control card from a, a gun range in the States because guns are used a lot in the States, it seems. Uh, and they, they need it on the target range. This brings the target forwards and backwards. Well, they come to us and they said, you know what? 
the, the files are missing, the company, you know, the person who made it doesn't exist anymore. What do we do? We've got hundreds of thousands of products out there in the States. What do we do? So they came to us and then, you know, we take the board. And I'm going to go through that process. So first of all, we take the board and uh, we ask for a sample. It's really important that we have a working sample. We can work from no working sample, but we need to repair it first in our repair lab. Then we have a working sample, and from that we know what we're doing. So we take the PCB, and then we start a bill of materials. And the key thing is that we want it to be, these are real key uh, buzzwords in the industry of reverse engineering, which is form, fit, and function. You want that PCB to be exactly the same as what it goes out with. And what it came in with goes out exactly the same. So the person that's installing it, as you guys probably all know, that guy doesn't want to have to think and modify the chassis or you know something like that in the machine. They want to just take it, plug it in, and it works. That's all they care about. And, and really, that's what we support, and that's how we do it. So we take the PCB, we document the circuit board, we take photos so we know what's going on, and then we start depopulating the board. So that's what happens here. And what we do is we start building up a bill of materials. So you can see there's just a sample bill of materials. And we start depopulating every single component that's on the board. We, we take them off, desolder them. Uh, we put them into little bags with little you know, stickers on that says this is a 5 ohm resistor and this is a 10 ohm uh, resistor and, and we label what they are. And often on a circuit board you have uh, reference designators and a reference designator is a uh, component marking on the PCB that says this is R1 or R15 or whatever it may be and then we document it. And if we don't have that documentation then well we have to build that documentation too. So we then take a photo and we label each component and then we bag it so that if we need to get back to it somehow we can actually get back to that. So that's really important for us. Um, so that's what we do with the bill of materials. And then we can obviously, now we know what the cost of the project is, then we can quote it out to the customer. Because until that point, you know, I, I don't know, how do you price that board? Like you've never seen it before, you've got no history, you have to price it somehow. So you need to know how many components on there, what's the complexity of the board, how long is it gonna take to manufacture? And, uh, and that's what we do in that process. So at that point, we then start delayering. Um, so this is actually a, a surface grinder um, and we take a board and then we can put it on the, the grinder and take it off layer by layer, thousands of millimeter at a time. And by doing that, what we can do, we don't do this for a two layer board, this is for a more complicated board. This board actually in question that I just videoed there was a, uh, a four layer board and it, or was it six? I think it was six layer actually. And, and it had many different layers, power planes, uh, traces, um, and what we have to do is know what's on each trace for us to be able to, to reverse engineer it. So that's why it's important for us to have a working comparison that can be destroyed. Now again, if we can't have that, we do have ways around that. There are x-ray uh, 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 techniques that we've done before uh, to enable us to see through the layers, but the simplest and the cheapest route is to go via the, uh, the grinding method, um, and that's what we're doing here. And then we digitize each layer. Now once we've got the digitized layer, we come into uh, what happens next. And what I've done here is I've actually taken, this is the PCB that we ground uh, and we ground down on the milling machine before, the grinder, and then we bring it into Photoshop and then we can actually become like an x-ray. So we flip the layers. So once it's scanned, we take every layer. We then line them all up so that we've got the layers and we know what each layer does. And then we can actually go through it like an x-ray. Um, and you know, I'm just going to bring it back so I can show you the video again, if it works. Um, and uh, we can basically go through each layer, layer by layer. And then from that, I have the information that I need to then extract the data. So we can see here, we're going through layer by layer, and you can see as I select the layer on here, you can see the data that starts appearing. So this was a, that's a, tra a signal trace layer, and then we've got another signal layer. This one's a ground plane going on here, and then we have the final side there. And that information is super important for us because the key thing is that it's form, fit, and function. We've got to make sure that it's the same. So if we're doing high speed, uh, high-speed traces and you know a lot of computers have high-speed traces that go inside there you need to make sure that that you have the the PCB layout exactly the same so there's no crosstalk on the traces and on the nets 
Um, so that's what we do as we, as we go through. We match everything up when we get into the software side of things. So we bring it into the, the EDA software and EDA electronic design automation tool. Uh, we bring it in and uh, then we start going through it. Now we actually developed at ENA Electronics a, a short finder brush just for this purpose. This is a, a special brush that it is honestly not that complicated, but there's nothing on the market uh, that does this. It's a, it's a brush that allows us to, like a multimeter, if you took a multimeter from one point and then kind of had a brush on it and just went beep, 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 you could go along every single trace to see where that trace goes to. You know, resistor one goes to IC one. You know, you don't know because the board's so big and it's got internal traces, you can't follow the trace. So this brush allows us to, to go on one point, brush across the board, find where the problem is um, or where the connection is, and then what we do is we verify that against the scanned image that we've got and make sure that that is actually routed on the, the software exactly the same because that's all imported at the same point. And uh, any, any changes the customer needs at this point, Gabe alluded to this before, you know, we, we often get asked, you know, can you, add, can you add an extra LED on the output? You know, we want it to trigger this output when it gets to this temperature. And, you know, that's not something you can do without, oh, thank you. Uh, that's not something you can do without having the circuit original, and then you would add that addition on, and you would do this in this stage. Making the, the schematic, you would add those extra uh, specifications in. So now we go onto the PCB, and as you can see here, we, we bring it into our EDA tool, um, and you take the original scan, the image scan, you put it into the software, and then we start tracing our traces on top of the, the layer to make sure it's identical, make sure the trace widths are the same, because obviously if they're not, you can, you can cause damage if they go into overcurrent, you know, if you've got too much current on that trace. Um, and then we bring it all through into that software, and then finally, we export those images. Uh, one thing that I actually do when I'm doing it is at that point, I bring it into the 3D viewer uh, in the software because often you want to make sure that you haven't flipped something because you, when you're doing it on a screen, it's very hard to visualize what's actually going on. So then you start rotating it and saying, oh, look, I put that text backwards or whatever it may be. Um, and then obviously we, we export it into what's called Gerber file. And uh, if you know anything about electronics, Gerber files are kind of your, your master uh, blueprint. You then send them off to the fabrication house um, and then they make the PCB at that point. At ENA, we don't actually make the PCB, the fabricated FR4 board, we don't do it at ENA. And the reason why that is, is because it's a very messy and dirty chemical substance. Uh, there's a lot of epoxy involved, but everything that else in this entire process gets done at ENA. So all the depopulation, the design files, the PCB is not made, then the PCB comes in and then we start populating it in-house um, is what we do. So we do that all in-house. So at that point, as I say, we, we take the Gerber files, we do our 3D view, make sure everything's looking right and in the right place. This is actually a power supply that um, uh, I was involved in uh, for a uh, nuclear power plant. And uh, it allowed, we had to you know, bring it in and see, okay, the traces are the right size and they were in the right places. And then the customer wanted custom silk screens. Um, so we added them on because they didn't want the original OEM silk screens. And we, we brought them all in. So then what we do is we bring it and we put it on our pick and place machine. Uh, so this is a Neodin uh, semi, well, fully automatic pick and place machine, uh, which we have in the shop here in Hamilton. Um, we, we take the PCB, which is, this PCB is actually this PCB right here, um, which I'm holding up. Uh, we put it on the machine and then we can obviously, we program it. Um, and it depends on the volume we're doing. You know, if we're doing one piece, we'll hand solder it because it's a lot easier to do that than to program the, the pick and place machine. But if we're doing anywhere between, you know, 10 and 50 or 10 and 100, whatever it may be, we, we then would put it on the, the pick and place machine. It automatically populates it. First of all, you put down a, uh, uh, we use a solder, solder printer, silk screen printer. Um, we, we apply the solder paste onto the, to the PCB, and then we take it off there, put it on the pick and place machine. The pick and place machine populates all the components on it, and then we put it into our reflow oven, which again, we have a, a in Hamilton, um, and we populate. This is a, a computer board that we did, uh, again, for a, a nuclear reactor in South Korea. 
Um, and this board is coming fresh off the, off the oven. It's a five zone oven that we've got, which allows us to control the heat profile. Um, and then the board comes out and it's fully populated, it's fully soldered, and then of course it needs testing. Um, so that's what we do next. So this is the, the rig I was telling you about. This is the, the, uh, the rig that's from the nuclear plant. What we've got here is uh, you've got right in this side here. This is a, uh, a power supply that we did. Again, I showed you the graphic of that earlier. And all of these cards that you see in this rig are obsolete. It's a company from Germany that went bust. Um, but the problem is this nuclear power plant has to keep going. And I'm, I'm not lying, like it is a nuclear power plant. Uh, they, they need to keep this plant going because it reached obsolescence. But now what do they do? The problem in a nuclear power plant is everything is certified. So you can't just replace this, this circuit with another power supply. The power supply isn't that complicated. It's five volt plus minus 12 volt at like five amps. It's like you could get an off the shelf power supply like that. I could get one tomorrow from DigiKey. But the problem is it's not certified. So when it comes in, it needs to be the same form, fit and function to allow the customer to plug it in and it just works. It's already been certified in the initial PCB manufacturing time. So they spent you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to certify this to, to EMC, EMI, and all the different certifications that you're gonna need for a power supply. Then you take that power supply, it reaches obsolescence. As I say, they're gonna have to spend that whole money again to recertify not just the power supply, but everything in the rack. So what they do is the simple solution is to reverse engineer. And in cases like this, they don't really have an option. Um, because, and then of course, don't forget, you've got to then train your, cost, your, your operators on the new power supply, retrofit your racks, update your documentation. Why bother? That's the genius behind reverse engineering. And, and to that extent, um, we have a, a project that we've got going on Oh, well, I'll finish off some testing, actually. With the, with the testing, we obviously then put it in a test rack or we build a test rack or a test rig, which allows us to fully test the product. Um, and then we can verify that it meets, meets the same specification as the original. If it does, off to the customer. And then they do the final validation in the field. Um, but uh, we don't have issues because we've tested it. And then this is the power supply that I was telling you about. So this is the original on the side here on the right hand side. The only additional thing that we were allowed to do was to extend the heat sink um, because they wanted some additional cooling. And that's actually what's gone on here. Um, but everything is the same. Like down to the color of the wire is so essential because any questions that are involved, then it's like certification again. Let's just do the same thing, make it exactly the same and there's no problems. And that's really what happens when we're doing uh, a lot of our work is that we need to just replicate it in the same way. Then we obviously back up the PCB uh, design files. We store them, any additional parts we've got, or sometimes the customers say, hey, can you not make me more? I don't want more. I just want to save this for the future. Get me a whole load of components. We keep them in a bin and leave them at our shop. And then when they need more, they order more. And that's how we've done it uh, for many customers. So a couple of projects that I wanted to show you. Um, this is actually the processor board from it. It's a Motorola CPU that's on there. Um, and you cannot believe when it gets to obsolete components, how hard it is sometimes to find the actual components. Not the board, like we've designed the board, but now you need the, the CPU. Like, where do you get it from? So we obviously, we've got a network of suppliers that we've used for the last 20 years that we, that we get parts from. Um, but this is an eight layer board. Uh, this is the original on the top left, and then the bottom right is our replacement, um, which is fully working. It's in the field. This is in the reactor in, uh, right now. Same form, fit, function. It actually has 50 meters of trace. This board is uh, like literally the size of this, and there's 50 meters of trace running backwards and forwards through the board, and it, it's, it's quite an overwhelming project, really, um, and uh, we've worked on that a lot. Um, again, this is an ADC board. Uh, analog to digital converter. This one, we couldn't get the power, the uh, DC DC converter, so we had to convert it into a new type of converter, which had to be justified. You know, it needs to be the same specification, needs to be, it needs to match or exceed the original expectation, uh, 
specification. Um, again, uh, used there. The power supply that we talked about. And then we don't just do stuff for nuclear, we do medical and military as well, um, and industrial. And that's really one of the things. This is a uh, panel view. So this is a, a, a keypad from an Allen Bradley 9 series CNC machine. It's you know hundreds of thousands of dollars to replace this CNC machine. The operator is already trained on it. They've already got the programs for it. They've already got the machine in site, on site. It's already working. But the problem is, the rubber membranes broke down because it's from a, a bearing factory. They make ball bearings. And the problem was the oil got into the rubber membrane, degraded the rubber membrane, and then the machine doesn't work because they can't press the button. So we, uh, we came up with a retrofit, which is basically just a keypad. Again, it's not, it's not complicated. Like some of the other stuff is complicated, but this is super simple. But the problem is who does it? Nobody does it. And if you want to get it done, they want you to do 100 pieces, 1,000 pieces. We're doing 10. In fact, when we get to 100, we start not being the best option because we're good at low numbers. That's where we're really good. Zero to 100, really good. 100 plus, we still do it, but we outsource our manufacturing elsewhere uh, rather than doing it all in-house. But we do the actual design work in-house, of course. Uh, so then we've got keypads. Uh, we talked about before, keypad not working, keypad broken, we've got a replacement, we have the design files for the future. And then a couple of other keypads, we've got some steel mill keypads um, that are going on here. We've got a, uh, this is a teach pendant from a robot, the, the overlay broke, uh, which is what's over here. Um, one of the buttons broke, so then we came up with a, a replacement keypad for that. Uh, we've got a G for NUC. Um, HMI that needed a keypad replacement. Again, the button had broke in the steel mill. And then, you know, this one's for OPG actually. Uh, it's an RTD transmitter. They wanted us to go through and, and make a, uh, a board that allowed us to, to transmit an RTD sensor. Um, and again, this one was all certified ourselves. We had to come up with a prototype. That's what went on with that one. And then, you know, this is just a simple board that, that needed, you know, going from a bare bones P, uh, prototype Vera board into a real, you know, PCB. And that was a project we did for uh, a local company here in Mississauga. So, you know, that's, that's what we do in a nutshell. And that's our process. Um, I'm now going to open the floor uh, to some questions. If obviously we run out of time, Christine's going to keep me on track on that. We can go to the side and chat. Um, if you do have any questions, obviously my contact information is there. Gabe's is there too. And uh, you know, we'd be more than happy to talk to you and uh, help you in any way we can. Please. So if anyone's got any questions, feel free. Yeah? What do you do when uh, CPUs are no longer available? Oh, sorry. Uh, what do you do when you ha no longer find CPUs available, for example? Do you emulate? Do you... Uh, find workarounds uh, from a software perspective using new processors to get equivalent functionality? Yeah, there's, there's a bit of both on that. Um, you can go the black box approach or you can find products on the market that are equivalent, of course. Um, it really depends on what it is and how old the processor is. Um, obviously, some of the newer stuff becomes a lot more complicated. And I'm not going to lie, that's, that's really, really complex um, with the new architectures that are out there. But some of the older architectures are pretty, you know, you have, for instance, ROM chips that you can't get anymore. Um, but there's equivalent ROM chips that you can buy. Um, so that's often what we do, but yeah, you can do the black box approach, and we've done that before, where you inject signals, and you say, okay, it's doing this, what's it doing on the output, and then you emulate the same thing with a, an Atmel chip rather than a Motorola CPU. Any other questions? No? Okay. Well, as I say, we're going to be over on the side. If you need us for anything, please, uh, please don't hesitate to give us a shout. You've got our contact information. And uh, I'd like to thank you um, for, for your time here. Thank you to the organizers of the event as well. And uh, yeah, if we can be assistance, please let us know. Thank you.